it's a lot more nuanced and we cannot blame you know the people who are the fishermen who are out there trying to make money for their family we can't blame people for eating fish who live in areas of the world where they depend on the fish as their primary source of protein uh, we can't blame people who work their whole life in NGOs to better the environmental system and to better the oceans um, because of where funding comes from for these things because we, we don't live in a perfect world. I think uh, we also can't demonize people who are quitting plastic straws or doing these little things for the environment because every little helps and as Sylvia Earle said, it's not one person or it's not one a situation it's it's a combination of everyone so all right good morning this is Kat from Ocean Pancake and today I want to do a little bit of my reaction to the sea spiracy documentary now I've been away for a few days so I'm a little bit behind but I've been uh, seeing snapshots of scientists reacting to sea spiracy I've been seeing the backlash of people who really support sea spiracy so I wanted to share my thoughts on the documentary, um, its mission, what it's achieved, and whether I think it's successful or not. So I got my coffee here, I got some water here, and I'm ready to watch the documentary this morning uh, and take some notes and let you guys know my thoughts. Also, I would just like to welcome you back to the channel. I know I've been gone for a little while. Um, today I'm doing a live stream, which is uh, GMT plus to 6.30 p.m. in Australia. That's about midnight, so not ideal, but it should save so you guys can watch it later on. I'm going to be with a couple of other amazing marine scientists uh, chatting about seaspiracy and a few other topics kind of that's been coming up. So make sure to check those out. Make sure to head on to Patreon, join the Patreon family. And yeah, welcome back to Ocean Pancake and let's start watching. Well, that, that, that was the documentary. So many thoughts and so many emotions after <laughs> watching that whole documentary. I have a bunch of notes. I decided not to do a direct reaction because I just thought that would be a lot of stopping and starting. But yeah, I'm really glad I took the time to watch that and I actually watched it with a friend. And it was an interesting way of kind of seeing a different person's perspective who has not spent the last five, six years of their life just reading about these topics. Now, I do understand why this documentary is problematic, especially amongst the scientific field and marine scientists and why people are speaking up about it. I know a couple of my friends are against it. I know uh, marine scientists have received death threats against it uh, for even mentioning any criticism. So I do want to kind of touch upon um, the reasons why um, this documentary isn't fantastic, but also why I think this documentary works. So let's get into it. Uh, Seaspiracy. This documentary touched on so many different aspects of what is going on in our oceans today and some of the largest issues that our oceans are facing. It started off with the issue of plastic and then quickly moved on to whaling, overfishing, shark finning, um, shark killing, bycatch, commercial fishing, fishing nets, uh, industrialization of fishing, uh, then the whole sustainability of fishing, um, the NGOs and governments in terms of fishing, uh, farm seafood, and then finished off with human rights, um, slavery on fishing boats, and the ethics of animal perspective. To start off with, I want to say that all of these aspects of what our ocean is facing are very real and troubling and are things I have talked about on my podcast or previous videos. I think it's important that we each do everything we can in terms of decreasing our personal plastic footprint from straws and plastic bags and everything. However, as you know, 
he mentioned, as Ali mentioned, it, that is not enough. And it is a little bit disconcerting that all these massive NGOs and organizations do point towards plastic straws when everything that's happening with fishing and overfishing is kind of hush-hush. Similarly to Cowspiracy, which is uh, done by the same producers, it had a similar kind of impact, I think, uh, back in 2016. I think that's when it was released. Uh, Cowspiracy kind of gathered all these details about industrial and commercial land farming and put them in a package which just convinced people to go vegan. Now, I went vegan from watching that documentary and while later on I heard a lot of criticism for that documentary similar as to Seaspiracy, it worked. It made me go vegan, it made me reassess um, the way I looked at the world, and it made me start doing deeper research into the various claims that the documentary made. Did everyone do the same thing as me? No. Did a lot of people go vegan because of Cowspiracy? Yes. Is that a net good effect? Yes. Is that a problem? That some of the things are a little bit skewed? I remember telling my friend that even if 50% of the facts presented in that documentary were correct, that was enough for me to quit eating meat and dairy. So I kind of see the same thing with Seaspiracy. Even if 50% of the facts or how they were skewed were incorrect, that is still a lot of reason why, on top of quitting plastic, on top of voting for greener futures, trying to minimize our environmental impact in other ways, we should stop eating commercial fish. And there are so many fantastic documentaries that you can watch to learn more about each of the specific issues he touched upon. So I'll include some of these here and in the link down below. So if you want to learn more about the negative impacts of overfishing and get some uh, less biased and kind of more in-depth information, check out these documentaries. There's so much research about this as well. In terms of farmed fishing, I have also spoken to um, people uh, on, on my podcast which have covered uh, which are from an NGO about why farmed fishing is bad and because wild caught fish are actually turned into fish meal and fish oil to then feed farmed fish. So it is just a different type of wild fishing. However, is the solution quite as simple as was presented in the documentary? I don't think so. Should you stop eating fish? Yes. If you have the ability to watch this video, to watch this documentary, to have the time and luxury of, you know, having a device, watching informational videos in, you know, in your free time, then chances are you live in a place where you have the opportunity to feed yourself in other ways rather than fish. However, is it realistic for everyone in the world to stop eating fish? No. I think the number is like 2.8 billion people on this planet depend on fish as their primary source of protein or one of their primary sources of food. This is all the coastal communities, unfortunately many in developing nations and again as was mentioned in the documentary, um, that was their way of life for hundreds of years and now commercial fishing is really messing that up. Now. I, I think this documentary was wonderful to kind of shine a light on what has happened in terms of industrialization of fishing and the commercial fishing and how people who have the option of eating really fancy plant-based foods which are created from algae but look like shrimp um, is a good option then all the power to us. If, if you have the possibility to make this choice and eat plant-based or seriously reduce your fish intake or choose to only eat fish that has been uh, fished by you or your friends in your local area, uh, then that's amazing. And that is really what I think this documentary was missing. 
it is targeted at the people who sit at home and watch Netflix. So in a way, I do understand what they were trying to do. And I think they did that well. For people who had very little experience um, about the ocean and the plight our ocean is facing, I think this documentary was beautifully made to capture the stunning beauty of uh, the mammals and the fish in the oceans and these natural habitats of coral reefs and pristine um, environments juxtaposed with this contrasting traumatizing view of piles of dead fish, frozen fish, the machinery of boats, the, the death of the whales, and then also the very um, visually representative data of those graphs of how many uh, scalped head sharks were decreasing. Apparently 99%, I didn't know that. So there's some things that I do want to check out and double check, but I want to make sure this video goes up before the live stream tonight. Um, and also, you know, the numbers of blue fin tuna and other fin tuna um, that have been caught. To say everyone needs to stop eating fish, it's, it's quite an ignorant thing to say. Um, I've lived in places uh, in Cambodia and the Comoros where some of the primary foods were just what the people there could catch and eat and a lot of these were the fish from their local islands. Even in the Comoros where I left, uh, where I lived for eight months, they had strict rules in their national park. So they had a marine park and they were only allowed to fish by line. So no nets were allowed to minimize um, the impact of bycatch and nets. And also no spear fishing was allowed. Not sure why that was, but that was the case. So there was no commercial fishing allowed. So the, the people in the village would commercially fish and like sell it to their village, but they were maybe coming back with 10, maximum 20 fish per day, um, which is completely different scales than what we're seeing in Seaspiracy and on these massive trawlers and these incredible, massive industrialized, commercialized systems that I can't even imagine how they're working. So that's a, it's two very different things. So people fishing for their own life and livelihoods, and then this commercial scale, which is not sustainable. And I think that's also why um, they, they mentioned that the Grind uh, fishing is sustainable because it is just, we saw the guy who was fishing the whales, he is fishing for himself. He values the life of that one whale and he feeds himself and his family. Does he have a choice? Probably. Is he taking responsibility for what he's doing? Yes. And I kind of, uh, I agree with him. I empathize with the fact that he thinks it's more sustainable and more ethically sound um, to kill one animal and then have that feed you for an extended period of time rather than to depend on some crazy industrial process to be killing a new chicken or a new fish every day to have a large variety of meats according to the whims of um, our now westernized and commercialized culture. I think this documentary really shined uh, a spotlight on some of the terrible things that are happening. I think it put some scientists and some NGO workers in a bad position where unfortunately, you know, after working in this field for a few years, you know, in, in the ideal world, yes, I'd love everyone to stop eating fish. I'd love for things to actually be dolphin safe or to, to have all the certifications, you know, mean 100% what they do and for it to be policed. But that is not the reality we are living in. As was mentioned in uh, the documentary, you can't police these international fishing fleets. It's just, it's just impossible. There are not enough resources. I know Sea Shepherd is out there doing the best that they can, but they still, what, have three ships? 
I love Sea Shepherd. I spent my time volunteering with them and going out on um, some of the local boats on the Gold Coast. I think the work that they do is invaluable in gathering data and bringing transparency to what is happening in our oceans. I think Captain Paul Watson says this beautifully, like if, if the oceans die, we die. If we wanna tackle climate change, we have to take care of the oceans. And um, in a way, there is no sustainable fishing. There is no sustainable fishing at this rate. And there is really no definition of sustainability. I'm currently studying a course in sustainable living. And one of the first units we did was trying to delve into what sustainability actually means because there is no definition. Unfortunately, it is a marketing ploy. Unfortunately, many people can use it, slap it onto their products without having a kind of standardized um, meaning of it across the world. I think as far as any of these NGOs um, that are putting the effort and work in and putting their life into this, they want these things to be dolphin safe and they want them to be sustainable. It's not their fault that so much of the funding to be able to do ocean conservation work comes from places like the fishing industry. I mean, there is not enough money in ocean conservation. You can ask anyone who works in this field. Money is the real kind of thing that ties the amount of projects that can work and the amount of people that can be out on the ocean. So that's why so many ocean related conservation jobs pay very little or they rely fully on activists or volunteers. And it's, it's because that's not where the money is. Now there was that whole section in the documentary where he is, you know, trying to make the Plastic Coalition, you know, say the thing where microplastics is the biggest deal or fish, fishing nets are the biggest deal when it, it doesn't really matter. Um, at the end of the day, microplastics are an enormous issue because microplastics come from any other plastics that then disintegrate from being in the salt and uh, from in the sunlight into smaller pieces and then they enter the food chain. So microplastics could actually be coming from fishing nets. Fishing nets, ghost nets, I've had a full episode with Maria from CNME who's actually going to be on the live stream tonight um, uh, where we talk about the impacts of ghost nets and how they um, capture animals on the surface, they die, so they sink to the bottom where they disintegrate, um, and once they disintegrate, the nets become buoyant again and come back to the surface, and the cycle just repeats. So we know ghost nets are a horrible thing in the ocean, not only because they are plastic and disintegrating into microplastics, but also because they are in this cycle of continuously capturing animals and it disintegrates. It's just, it's just a mess. In terms of the whole whaling and dolphin, there's so many documentaries you could watch. The Cove, Blackfish, that I highly encourage you to check out to learn more about what happens in terms of Sea World and um, the killing of these whales. In terms of overfishing, enormous issue. And again, best thing you can do is stop eating commercially caught fish. Finning, shark finning, large amount of the sharks being caught is for the fin soup, so obviously don't eat shark fin soup, but it is also bycatch. And in places like Australia, it's actually targeted fishing of sharks. And just like similarly to what they were talking about there, um, why they were killing the dolphins in Taiji, is um, they're killing the sharks here in Western Australia. And this is, this is my speculation, but basically because humans have been putting such an increased amount of pressure on the fishing stocks here in Australia, Western Australia, um, East Coast of Australia. And um, for a while, no shark fishing was allowed. Suddenly there was um, less of those level two uh, fish, so less of those uh, fish that we would eat and sharks would eat and therefore there was suddenly a larger competition for those fish with the sharks so the sharks would be coming closer to um, recreational fishing boats and biting their catch or there have been some um, shark uh, incidents shark bite incidents with humans and i think this is all related to the increased pressure on the fish stocks, therefore making the sharks come into closer proximity with humans. So as a result, in Australia, they've decided to start culling sharks. So that's a whole, anyway. 
Then we have the whole problem of bycatch of so many of these fishing nets and systems not being, um, you know, targeted. I think I read somewhere that for shrimp, there's a 90% bycatch rate, which is insanity. So uh, the target is only the target of the fish they're trying to catch is 10% and everything else is wasted. Farm seafood, extreme issues, we know that because of the lice and the close proximity of these fish and not being able to swim properly. Um, yeah, farmed seafood is also not an ideal solution. Again, there's so many, there's so many different little parts of this and I think Ali did an amazing job to try and kind of compile everything that's wrong into the ocean into one one documentary but unfortunately I think he simplified it too much it's a lot more nuanced and we cannot blame you know the people who are the fishermen who are out there trying to make money for their family we can't blame people for eating fish who live in areas of the world where they depend on the fish as their primary source of protein. Uh, we can't blame people who work their whole life in NGOs to better the environmental system and to better the oceans um, because of where funding comes from for these things, because we, we don't live in a perfect world. I think uh, we also can't demonize people who are quitting plastic straws or doing these little things for the environment because every little helps and as Sylvia Earle said, it's not one person or it's not one uh, situation, it's, it's a combination of everyone. So I hope, I hope this documentary opened your eyes to some of the horrible things that are happening to the ocean and have kind of brought you a greater understanding of how vital the ocean is not only to sequestering carbon to slow climate change to feeding the world's populations to keeping but also that you're going to go beyond just this one documentary and do more research and i hope this has sparked something in you to keep looking and keep learning and join the mission to 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 make our world and our oceans a better place and yes eating fish is a large part of it, especially if you have a choice, if you have an opportunity to do the research and find alternatives, then you should definitely do it. And I fully believe that. One of the best ways to improve the system is to decrease the pressure on our oceans. And the only way we are going to decrease pressure on our oceans, if you, you stop buying fish. And then maybe if you stop buying fish, your cousin, your uncle, your brother, your sister, your friend, your colleague might stop buying fish too. And then it will trickle out and create that massive impact to the point where fishing may become sustainable again. Because it used to be. But unfortunately now we are taking far too much from the oceans. And while I don't think the oceans are going to be fish free or covered by plastic by 2048, our oceans may be at the brink that they'll never be able to recover again and it is up to us to do what we can. So please let me know your thoughts on this documentary. I'm sorry if this video was a little bit scattered. There are just so many things I wanted to say. I will be having a in-depth conversation with my friends Telly from Telly's Marine Tales, Maria from Maria C and Me, and then of course Marine from Marine Science Cafe. Tonight at this time um, where they're marine biologists and they actually work in some of these NGOs so I think it's going to be a very valuable kind of information. Uh, coming from more the ethical animal perspective, I'm going to be there kind of maybe playing a bit of the devil's advocate, we shall see. but. Please let me know your thoughts on this whole thing. Did you think the documentary was good? Are you gonna keep eating fish? Do you think that Ali focused too much on the personal kind of impact of not eating fish versus how we need to change the government structures or the funding for these NGOs? So yeah, let me know your thoughts down below and uh, I'll see you guys soon, bye.